brave and very violent, when a woman finds herself in that area, society begins to think that it's not very appropriate. And it's unfortunate, but uh, women are an integral part of society. So once society holds that rule, that, that view, men hold that view and women also hold that view. But you cannot say that by being a woman, a person is naturally, you know, not in the position or capacity to engage in public life. I think that these are social constructions, these are man-made inhibitions that have, you know, undermined women's effective participation in politics. I mean, you've been in governance. Um, yeah. Share your own experience. Um, how did it feel like at that time when you found yourself in active, you know, uh, 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 um, how do I call it, work? Okay. Um, at the government level. Okay, great. I would even like to give some comparative um, view here. The, the position of, you know, um, policy in terms of uh, state, Minister of State, is, is quite bureaucratic. So um, you have the structures you work with and all you do is influence the policies to, uh, to, to shape it within the framework of your party's manifesto. But the real politician is in the electoral process, the campaign. And that is very, 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 very tedious, very aggressive. You have long days. And, you know, you are going against the institutions of societies that sometimes does not allow you to play as effective as men play within a political space. So these are the real challenges. And, and, and what are these institutions, for instance, that you, you speak Oh, the so. norms, the values, the ideas, you know, the... the, the various, you know, social discriminations, ageism, because I, I remember that was one thing that was used against me. I, I was hearing it everywhere. She's small girl, small. I'm like, really, do I look that young? Uh -huh. so, so ageism, sexism in general, you know, um, the moral issues that comes with women who find themselves in public space, especially politics. So these are, you know, that, these are the social and cultural issues that really, really undermines the uh, women's, you know, being, women being looked as an equal party and competent party in the process of, you know, politics. Uh, uh, Doc, and you are a man, so I'm happy to be asking this question to you. <laughs> um, do you see a deliberate attempt on the part of men, for instance, to keep this gap as it is, or probably even, uh, you know, widened? <laughs> um, I don't see it as such. Um, but just that, uh, historically, as uh, she was... Uh, trying to uh, allude to, um, men ha have always been in the lead. And let me say that uh, if you read the literature, um, we didn't mean to take the lead, but uh, our leadership was just to protect you. Oh, <laughs> <Interesting>. <laughs> we, we always uh, thought that uh, women, you know, you are weaker compared to men, and therefore uh, those days when we had to go for war, we rather want to hide you somewhere so we will lead the attack i think we would have to find uh, another word for <laughs> weaker you know because every time we've spoken about mm. such issues you know yeah, yeah, we, so we hear people say okay so women are the the, the mm -hmm. weak well yeah even the good book talks about women being the weaker vessel um is that the reason why that you always want to lord over it all uh, yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't say that but that is the unreality if you go to the literature why we are where we are is because of that kind of uh, notion. I do know that uh, uh, you are not weaker at all, um, but uh, that was what was uh, assumed to be the case. And so we always have five key roles and, um, that uh, we need to play, wh whether you being a man or a woman. And these are uh, the role of uh, a motherhood, that is a procreation. Mm -hmm. And here, um, since uh, Adam Tam, women, are known to be the agents of procreation. And so they give birth, they have to care for the children. Um, another rule have been managers of home. And women are, are always the ones who wash, they are the ones who cook, they are the ones who clean, they do all those things. And we've accepted for many years that that is what they're supposed to be doing. And um, when you move from there, we have a, a society or community organizers. Women are always uh, in, 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 in lead when it comes to uh, societal, I mean, you know, organizations such as wedding, funerals, and all that. And men uh, prefer to be in production. We go out there, we produce, and we bring money home, that has, uh, or food home. And then um, another one is governance. We were always, I mean, in governance. And so globally, now there is um, a strategy called gender mainstreaming. 
gender mainstreaming is that um, the three things that I first talked about, procreation, um, managers of home, and then um, uh, as community and organizers, they are preserved for, men, um, for women, while production and governance is uh, supposed to be for, for, for men. Now, the gender mainstreaming uh, is a strategy to get more women to be part of the production process, to get more women to be part of governance, and also get more men to be part of home management. And so, we, when we go home as men, we need to start cooking. We need to start washing. <laughs> it's something that we don't have to say, no, it is for only I mean, women. Women are no more recognized as weaker, as I, I put it in the beginning, weaker sex, because it is not true. Whatever a man can do, a woman can do it. But I don't want to say that. I don't want to say better. They can do it equally. Whatever a woman can do, a man can also do it. And so we want to see that balance where women are being part of the production process and men are also being part of home management. I mean, we definitely have to, you know, kind of support one another. So I, I kind of, in part, will accept, you know, your submissions. But uh, we've been speaking to a number of you out there as well, picking your thoughts on the issue of um, women in leadership positions, women in governance, and, and why you think that till today we're still recording very low numbers. Um, let's hear that video. When it comes to women in politics, I think... Um, most or majority of the seats in government are channeled or are given to the men. And so you go and you find out that little proportion is given to that of the women. And so I think that the best thing is, let's say, to reserve some number of seats for the women because you realize that there are so many stereotypes even when the woman wants to take up a position, knowing that if I'm going against a man, then most definitely I'm not going to take it, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to get the position. And so I think opening up space seats, specifically made only for women, I mean, you should have like a cutoff point. You should have, let's say, 20 seats amongst um, 50 seats reserved for women, or if you want to do it, 25, 25, just for gender equality. This whole issue of gender inequality emanated from the traditional Ghanaian society where we think that um, women are second class citizens in the sense that men do the work, they bring home money and then it's the wife's duty to take care of the kids, the home and everything. So this whole thing is from way back where women don't work. In fact, they are not educated. So I think that the key factor to bridge this gap between men and women is education in the sense that when the girls are educated, you, you have the right. You can speak for yourself. What men can do, you can also do. What they go to school to acquire, you can. You are also getting that same knowledge. So you are. It's like now you become a part of society where you can actually contribute to the benefits of society. So it wouldn't be all about the men doing the work and then we staying home to take care of the kids. So I think that education is the key and it will help us go a long way because women also have their ideas. In fact, we contribute greatly to the development of the society, just that we are not given a chance to. All right. Well, so those were some views um, that we gathered from some of you, of course. Um, as this was going on, though, we're all having our own conversation as well <laughs> in the studio. And I was asking, the first gentleman actually speaks to the fact that, you know, we, we kind of reserve certain positions for women. And I'm asking that, uh, what makes anybody think that we can't earn those positions? And I think Doc has a very interesting response to that. Yes. Uh, so when we are... I'm talking about gender. One, uh, two main issues always come to the fore, and they are gender equity and gender and equality. Conceptually, the two are different issues. And uh, when we say gender equity or um, equity in general, then we are talking about a situation where a system gives an individual what the individual actually needs to live a better life, what you actually need. That is the, uh, when a system does that, we say that system is being equitable. And then now uh, we have uh, equality. I mean, equality is giving what the individual is supposed to get. It is giving what the individual is supposed to get. And so um, when you compare equality to equity, it tells you that um, uh, what women today need 
it's not I mean equality, but I mean equity. Let me use uh, uh, I mean competition. We all been going for um, I mean intercool during school days, and when runners are sprinting around the over tracks, uh, and you place all of them on the same lane. Let's say I'm um, 800 meters, and you place all of them on the same lane. That is called equality. Definitely, the one at the outer lane will be disadvantaged. So what do we do? You always stagger the positions. So the one at the outer lane is first, with the other coming behind. That tells you that, um, and that is what is called um, equity. And women don't need um, equality. Women need um, equity. It is equity that will lead us to um, equality. Why? Because historically, we have discriminated against you. Women have suffered uh, quite a number of um, discriminations. And th that. All those combined have put you way behind men. And so for, us, for you to be where we are now, it means that we do, you, you don't need only a level playing field. We really need to push you up so that even as we are all progressing, when we are all running, you can run faster to catch up with us. And so we talk today about gender equity, but not gender and equality. It's this, it is the equity that will lead us to uh, equality. Vicky, well, well, we have achieved this equality that we talk about. Yes, we will achieve it. And uh, as Doc said, the equality means equal playing field. Mm. That comes with probably the laws we have. We have right. laws in Ghana that allow every woman to participate in politics. So why do we still have the gap? Because despite the laws, there are still some inhibitions that deter women or that, you know, frustrate women's ability to participate. And that's when equity comes in. And that's by equity, he means affirmative policy. So that women need to be given certain special conditions in order to be able to correct the historical gap between women and men. So it's a work in progress. It's a work in progress. Well, yes. There are conversations about um, affirmative policies, even mm -hmm. at the parliamentary mm -hmm. level. Right. Um, until it's a deliberate process. I think that it cannot be progressive. When it's progressive, we are going to delay in the process. But what we have to do is that we have to have the political will to say that we have to put these and these functions, this and this information, this and these structures in order to be able to achieve it. So I think that it has to be a deliberate, conscious policy approach, action policy approach. Doc, I would like to stay with uh, Vicky for one last time. So um, you did mention early on about the, the OWA yes. initiative. Tell us about it and how it seeks to encourage you know, um, and, and ensure women participation in societal development. Thank you. The POA Forum has come to stay. We are looking at having a conversation every quarter. But next Tuesday, 31st of October, mm -hmm. at 4.30 p.m., we are going to have the first POA Forum. And the conversation is, why do we still have few women in Ghanaian politics? Like I said, because it's a post-election year. And it pr promises to be very interesting because we are in collaboration with the Center for Social Policy Studies, College of Humanities, University right. of Ghana, right. where Doctor is uh, an economics developer, development <laughs> lecturer at the center. And uh, they are, we are partnering with them. They are supporting us with their um, academic and intellectual resources to, to shape the conversation. So we have very interesting panelists on book who are going to speak to the subject matter, to the topic. Uh, for example, we have Reverend Dr. Lawrence Tete, who is a man of you know, very right. international repute when it comes to mm -hmm. Christian you know, um, doctrine and all that. We also have Dr. Vladimir Echidanso, who we all know him, he's not new to us, and he's a man of diplo diplomatic experience, and uh, he's also academic as well. We have Professor Ellen Bute Duku Aite from the Center for Social Policy Studies, University of Ghana. And we also have Honorable Nano Yelita with wide experience in civil society, and also the immediate gender minister, uh, Minister for Gender and Social Protection. We also have Honorable Christine Checher, who is uh, a complete experience you know, diverse experience any woman can have in politics. She has held various capacity uh, positions, such as she's been a minister of state, so policy. She has also been, um, how do you call it, an elective officer as a member of parliament for 12 years. And I also read an interesting so, history. She was also the first mayor of Cape Coast. So right. we have, I believe that these panelists constitute very diverse opinion and experiences and competence. And we are hoping to have very interesting conversation and have very interesting you know, 
discussions that hopefully yeah, will to the, you know, to give topic. us a needed impact. Yes. All right. So I want to say thank you once again. Very rich, you know, lineup of speakers, if you ask me, with yes. very rich experiences in their various fields of endeavor. If you can, I could add something just, small just to it. quickly. Yes. The forum is absolutely free. Okay. There's no fee to be That's paid. Important. So mm -hmm. all you have to do is to call this number to reserve a seat. Boy. Please give us a number. What's the number again? And okay. then the venue. So the forum is taking place at the British Council. 4.30 okay. p.m. prompt. So please, you have to be there at least by 4 p.m. to get seated. British Council? Yes. 4.30 p.m. prompt. October 31. Yes. And okay. the number is 055-144-5757. Okay. Okay. As simple. Zero five five one four four five seven five seven is the number to call. It's happening um, at the British Council next Tuesday, October thirty one. Yeah. Uh, so be there. We're talking women in governance. Thank you, Dr. George Donfe, uh, the Institute of what? Uh, Center for Social Policy. Uh -huh. Thank you for that one. And then of course Victoria um Hammer Thank is uh, the executive director of POA. All right, well, so wish you all the best. Thank and you. let me just quickly add that it is an EIB partnership project. Yes. So uh, we will be there to bring you all the details and all the happenings right there at the British Council, hopefully next Tuesday and, then of course, subsequently. Uh, well, the show continues with more. We're talking women, so enjoy this video. We'll be back. In the mirror, I see a woman.